I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking all about EMDR. This is a specific type of therapy that can really help address trauma and going through the fertility journey, either dealing with a diagnosis itself or what we see as a theme with uh, premature ovarian insufficiency, diminished ovarian reserve, low AMH, high FSH, and anyone really on the fertility journey is trauma, childhood trauma, other trauma besides actually the trauma of um, receiving the fertility diagnosis. So excited for you to listen to this episode. We dive deep into EMDR and really there's eight phases of this and how this can help you right now effectively pinpoint the trauma and move it out of your body. Let's go. Hey Tess, excited to have you on the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So if you could share your journey, really how you became to to do this work. Yeah. Um, So I've been in the mental health field now for about 10 years. Um, I, of course, got inspired by my own journey, like so many of us have. Um, You know, I did my own therapy work, my own trauma healing. I'm still on that path, um, as we all are. So yeah, really inspired by my own um, healing and the people who I've met along the way. Um, I've kind of bounced around in the mental health field. I've done research, I've done, um, community mental health, substance use, children, child protective services, adult protective services, crisis stabilization. And now I'm in private practice. Um, so yeah, I've gotten a lot of different experience along the way. Um, and now I am EMDR trained and really focus on that trauma healing population. Yeah, I love that. I think you know, so definitely with people on the fertility journey and specifically with these diagnoses that we're that we're dealing with so the low AMH and high FSH, diminished ovarian reserve, premature ovarian insufficiency. So I know like firsthand what that's like basically being told that the only way you'd ever have your own children is with donor eggs. And then, you know, I went off and, and didn't even get a second opinion. We're we're helping couples getting pregnant naturally or with their own eggs when they go to IVF with those diagnoses. So that in itself, like getting a diagnosis where an RE tells you, oh my goodness, you're going to struggle, that in itself can be traumatic if that's how you frame it um, as trauma. And then and then also we're finding kind of themes we see with these diagnoses is, is trauma in itself. So childhood trauma or other trauma that someone may have experienced perhaps before they got this diagnosis. Um, and so... Actually, can you just add, let's just t- start with the first question about like the the if you see it as trauma or not? Because I actually like, although obviously getting that diagnosis at twenty eight for me was tra- traumatic. I, I I didn't personally view it that way. Now mm-hmm. I know looking back that I was stressed and I worked a lot on my chronic stress and you know because I'm just kind of like go go go. But I didn't see it as that way. So what what's your take on if someone's like I don't feel it was traumatic. You yeah. know, like, even though it is traumatic, like I'm not minimizing what I went, what, what I went through or if someone has experienced it because everyone deals with it differently. But what's your take on if someone views it a certain way? Yeah. I mean, I think it's very subjective and very personal. You know, trauma can mean so many different things. We used to, in the mental health field, look at it as like big T versus little T trauma, but that's not so much more a thing, you know, because it's so subjective. Um, but for me, trauma is anything that has a lasting impact on you that um, comes out in different ways of like different um, symptoms like anxiety or even somatic symptoms like pain or digestive issues or negative cognitions, negative beliefs about yourself. Um, and we know that like shame is a big, um, part of trauma too. So anything that makes you feel like a sense of shame about yourself or any sort of like negative belief about yourself. Um, but again, it's so many different things and I, it's definitely, I can see how it would be, um, traumatic being on the infertility journey for sure. Mm -hmm. And then also, so for me, then it obviously it manifested in all these other, other health issues, which perhaps a diagnosis did that, which may have been, yeah, my body's way of coping. And and then I had all these food sensitivities and gut infections and chronic stress. Um, And then, you know, I've done a lot of work on, on working through that with, with, with coaching and therapy to, to, to help myself on that. And so, um, being able to, to view it a different way, but as you say, it can come out and, you know, it's not just, it can come out in different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so many people don't even realize like, you know, they have, they start with the symptom or the thought of like, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not lovable, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
And they don't even tie it back to like, oh yeah, this is why I'm that way because of all this trauma I went through as a child or whatever. Like they don't recognize that as trauma yet until we like get into it, you know, and be like, okay, well, what is the root of this? Where did this come from? You didn't just like come out the womb thinking like you were, you know, defective or, or some way, you know? So yeah. yeah I'm, I'm digging into all this piece now because I wouldn't think I, I didn't think I had childhood trauma, but I think all of us have, there's some sort of piece from childhood, which we may be carrying with us. And, um, as I un, uncover some more of these things, I'm like, Oh, interesting. Where did that stuff come from? Like, you know, my dad's like born businessman, like entrepreneur was very like always work, work, work and super impatient. And I like, I literally that still to this day, the impatience thing, I feel like I, I just like took on the impatience that, and even if I find someone when I'm talking to someone, if I feel that I've talked too much and they're like, okay, I'm done. I'm kind of like, okay, they're done. And I got to move on. And like, I feel this, like, so that kind of came up for me and not wanting to be heard, I guess, for, for years. Right. Where I'm like, I don't want to take anyone's time up because they're busy and they want to hear me and all this sort of stuff. And now, you know, I've worked on that piece. It's still not some perfect thing, but it's interesting as you kind of go back and look at some of these things, it's like, Oh, that's interesting where that, where that came from. Yeah. Yeah. And I would classify that as like attachment trauma. You know, most of us do have some level of attachment trauma because, you know, our our parents do the best that they can, but they're functioning out of their own trauma. Usually, you know, it's that generational trauma and everything. So yeah, attachment trauma is huge too. Um, And that's different than like the um, single event trauma, like a car accident or something. And then there's complex trauma, developmental trauma. There's all different types of trauma, but yeah, yeah. I would never leave the house. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So, so today we're going to be talking all about, uh, EMDR. So this is kind of like a little buzzword going on right now. People are trying to, you know, exploring EMDR and it can be really effective for trauma. And, um, so I'm bringing it in actually into our fab fertile method as having you as a referral source for people to, um, be able to access this, this type of trauma therapy. So, um, can you, first of all, uh, what is EMDR, the acronym? What does that mean? And, um, let's just talk about that first. So it stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. So it's a big mouthful. Um, It is a trauma treatment. Um, It's one of the only trauma treatments recognized by the World Health Organization. Um, The Department of Defense Veterans Affairs uses it. So it's it's widely used internationally. Um, It's heavily based in research. Um, But it's also pretty cool because it kind of takes aspects of like, Um, somatic work, mindfulness, um, you know, a little CBT also. So it kind of like combines all different types of therapies, um, but it's also its own unique thing too. Can you explain the um, somatic therapies if people don't know what those are? So somatic is like, it's kind of building on that mind body connection. So we know that trauma is stored in the body. Um, if anyone's heard or read the book, the body keeps the score by, um, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. That's a great book. He talks all about how like, um, trauma actually gets like stored and stuck in our body. So we have to access the body as well as the mind to heal from trauma. And so what are some of the studies that are, that are um, talking about the efficacy of EMDR? Because there's all these different, and EMDR has been around for, like, so, so how long has it been around for? Yeah, so it started in the 80s by Dr. Francine Shapiro. Um, she was the founder of it and everything. There's different like newer offshoots of it, like attachment focused EMDR and all that, but it's based on her traditional work. Um, there's so many studies. I can't even count how many studies now on EMDR. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's been empirically evidence-based researched, all of that, um, and shown to be really effective. Um, one of the like main kind of like research components is this adaptive inter adaptive information processing. So AIP, they call it. Um, And it's essentially stating that like any type of pathology, which is like any type of symptom. So whether you have anxiety or like um, it can even present as ADHD or any somatic things, um, they're saying that they're related to um, usually traumatic event that happened like in childhood or earlier in life or whenever, you know, but that's what EMDR is looking at. Like, okay, we have a traumatic event and something happened along the way that caused these different symptoms like anxiety or whatever to show up. Um, And it's kind of like 
stuck in your body, stuck in your brain, and we have to find a new adaptive way of processing it. Yeah. And that's why that this, like those negative thoughts on that vicious loop, and then it just keeps com- comes out at, you know, inopportune times. And we're on the fertility journey, trying to get ourselves out of that fight or flight down to the parasympathetic, um, right. all things with the biochemical and then with the, the, you know, the mindset and addressing trauma is, is key. Cause if we're up in that, you know, fight or flight, the chronic stress piece, um, it, it, that you know, your body wants to survive, not procreate. And that's why addressing these things, although difficult, like the more you push it down, like you've got to bring it up and, and, and deal with it. You know, for years I, you know, I was detached and thought it was fine. And then it came out in other sorts of ways. I remember like when I was younger, I was like TMJ, like my jaw was like locked tight and yeah. all these different, like very, like eh, very contracted symptoms. Mm-hmm. So, um, so let's talk about, so like, what, what are some types of symptoms that someone could be experiencing that um, EMDR can be really helpful for? I mean, of course we can start with any sort of negative cognition. So those thoughts of like, I am unworthy, I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, you know, um, anything like that. We can start with that. And then we usually trace it back to different memories um, that could have influenced that thought. Um, We can start with body sensations. So, you know, pain or anxiety showing up different ways, Um, any, really any symptom. I mean, it's going to be good for most anyone. Um, There's some contraindications, but it can be very effective for most anyone. Any contraindications you want to share? It usually just if you have like a dissociative disorder, which all of us dissociate to some extent, but it's talking more about like the dissociative identity disorders, which is very rare. So, or if you're um, heavily using substances, that could be a contraindication. Although some people do find it useful for that population. Um, and then some medications as well. And so let's, let's take us through, so there's eight phases of EMDR. So let's just go through all of them and kind of, yeah, let's sort of take us through here. So the first one being um, history taking. So what, what are we looking at there? Yeah. So the good thing is as the client, you don't have to know all the phases because it's a lot of information, but um, that's why we're trained in all of this. But I will give you a good like snapshot of what it actually looks like. So it is eight phases. Um, That doesn't mean necessarily it's going to be eight sessions. It can be um, a quick process or it can be longer just depending on like what the person brings to the table. You know, Um, in my training, they told us Um, so you can clean the kitchen table, you can clean the kitchen or you can clean the whole house. It's up to you how much trauma you want to unpack, you know? Um, yeah. So, so the first stage is, um, history taking. So we're basically like, all right, well, what do we want to target here with EMDR? You know, what, um, in your history, do you feel relevant that you want to process? You know, we're not opening up the trauma memories here because that can be re-traumatizing. Um, but we're just taking like a basic history. So, um, looking at family relationships, partnerships, anything like that, getting basic history information. Next, we move into preparation, which is a lot of grounding, laying the groundwork. Um, A lot of polyvagal theory is tied in here too about um, accessing our nervous system, calming our nervous system, getting out of that fight or flight mode. Um, Because again, like we want to create a safe container, a safe um, platform to do this trauma work because it's really intense and it can be hard. Um, So we want to give you the skills to be able to ground, be able to contain throughout this process. And so just back to the history taking. So then with that, would you do that ACE score at all? Or would you yeah, yeah. Yeah, do that? Yeah. Um, the ACE questionnaire, if anyone's familiar, it was a um, really large study done in the 90s. And they looked at how childhood trauma impacts all sorts of different factors. And they found that it literally impacts everything. <laughs> and as your ACE score increases, I think it's like a score of four or higher shows significant correlations with like all sorts of health factors, cancer risk, um, even like a a social risk, like um, your ability to keep a job, things like that. Like it it impacts everything. So yeah, at that point, we would um, look at your A score, look at, you know, different childhood trauma factors. Okay. And obviously someone coming in here has to be open to to looking at these ones. Now, if we're on the fertility journey, we may just have a like a broken loop kind of saying, I'm, I'm broken. I'm, um, I'm not fertile. It's never going to work. You know, the RE 
has told me, well, well, I'm going to struggle. So those kind of reoccurring thoughts and getting that diagnosis, which can be very traumatic and thinking that you're, you know, how you visualized, you know, um, planning for your child was, was certainly not through, you know, multiple rounds of IVF or having to change your diet and making all these, these changes. It was like, maybe you thought you'd, you know, get pregnant on your first, your first go around. So it's typically most people have come to us after, you know, years of, of trying this, of trying. So, um, would you then, then just take like a, a piece or you just basically whatever someone wants to you kind of have them lead it or how, how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. We definitely have them lead it. You know, people are experts on themselves and everything. I don't claim to be a healer or anything. I believe everyone has that power within them. Um, and EMDR is, really does take a self-healing approach as well. Um, I pulled out a quote by Francine Shapiro that I thought was really important to um, talk about this self-healing. Um, I don't, do you want me to read it? Yeah, sure. Helpful. Um, so again, kind of going back to that AIP model, the adaptive information processing, it says, um, it's the concept of psychological self-healing, a construct based on the body's healing response to physical injury. For instance, when you cut your hand, your body works to close and heal the wound. If something blocks the healing, such as a foreign object or repeated trauma, the wound will fester and cause pain. If the block is removed, healing will resume. A similar sequence of events seems to occur with mental processes. That is, the natural tendency of the brain's information processing system is to move toward a state of mental health. However, if the system is blocked or becomes imbalanced by the impact of a trauma, maladaptive responses are observed. Um, these responses may be triggers. Um, so, yeah, it's essentially saying, like, if the block is removed, which we're doing in EMDR work, then you essentially will go on to heal on your own. Um, so I really like that aspect about EMDR too. It's not really the therapist doing, I mean, of course I'm guiding you through the process, but the person is doing the work to heal like in their own brain as well. Yeah. And with this journey, like there's a lot of triggers being, being just being triggered and like seeing a family, seeing a pregnant belly with baby showers, you know, gender reveals, um, getting your, getting your numbers back, your FSH and your, your AMH. Many people don't even want to see the numbers because they were so low before. Um, even, you know, we're seeing them improve, but it's still very, the process of tracking ovulation, all this sort of stuff. There's like so many, so many triggers. So if someone could, could use it for the, for, for, for that as well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, you know, we can start with like, okay, what is the negative cognition associated with the infertility journey? We'll trace it back to like, what is, you know, where it came from, whether it's from the doctor saying like, you can't get pregnant, you know, or whether that's from, so say the thought is like, I'm defective. Maybe it did come from that, but maybe it also came from, you know, something in childhood as well, or maybe it didn't, you know, it, again, it's, the, it's up to the person, whatever they bring to the table, you know, we're going to work with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's hugely traumatic to hear and to deal with for sure. And then the next one we have is assessments. So what are we doing there? So then we're actually activating the memory process. So we're going in and saying like, well, where do we want to start? We're going to pick where we want to start. Usually we start with the oldest, like earliest memory. Um, so we're going to pick that, pick kind of like the image that brings that memory to mind, um, pick the negative cognition that's associated with it. So say it was the doctor saying like, I can't get pregnant. And then the negative cognition is I am defective. Um then we're going to like rate the level of disturbance. So maybe that's at an eight out of a 10, you know, level of disturbance. Like I really feel triggered and impacted by that. Um, then we're going to determine, well, what would you rather believe? So instead of I'm defective, you know, maybe um, I am capable of healing, you know, my body is powerful. I don't, anything that's going to help you, you know, be more, um, more functional, more adaptive. And again, it doesn't have to go from like, total, like, you know, I'm unhappy too. I am happy. You know, sometimes that can't, that's a little too far, you know, but we could go for something more neutral, something more that's going to serve you more than that thought that's not serving you currently. Um, so we move through that and then we determine, so where is that feeling showing up in your body? Is it in your, a pit in your stomach? You know, is it in your throat? Does your throat feel closed to, is your chest, um, is it in your hands? You know, we're going to find it in the body. Um, and then we move into the reprocessing of it. It's interesting when someone like years ago, when they sort of said to me, where do you feel that in your body? I'm like, 
I don't feel it anywhere. I don't even know what you're even talking about. So, and now I'm like, oh, I can feel it in my heart. I can feel it in my stomach. I can feel it all over. But in the beginning, they're like, where do you feel that? I'm like, that is the most insane question I've ever heard. So uh, what if someone can't, like, can't feel it in their body? How do you get them to, to anchor it? Totally, yeah. And we'll do a lot of that in the groundwork phase, you know, the preparation, like getting in touch with our body. Cause a lot of us are very disconnected and, and that can be a defense mechanism, a dissociation too, you know? Um, and we're also just not really like talking about like how to hold space for emotions and how to feel emotions, you know? So we go through a lot of that um, and, you know, educating them on how that shows up and everything. But again, people are the experts on their body, you know? Um, But it is really fascinating. I have this little chart um, somewhere, but it talks about where usually the body sensations, like what they're associated with. So like, um, if people feel it in their throat, sometimes that can be like feeling not heard, feeling like you can't speak up, feeling like you don't have a voice. Um, chest can be grief or it can be, um, unmet needs, you know? So we have like different body parts that are usually associated with different things. Again, it varies, but that's pretty interesting. That is really interesting. Yeah. We do some uh, fertility yoga and it's sort of the different, like the hips are feeling grief and then talking about the liver and different organs and things like that, how it's storing all those different, like kind of those stuck emotions. Then you can kind of release it with, in in that case, with the fertility yoga and typically Hatha or restorative to let it out. Um, Mm -hmm. And back when you were kind of saying some of the the words, yeah, we've done a lot. We've done many episodes on affirmations, and I've done some of our group programs too. When we used to do group uh, programs, like co-facilitated a mindfulness program with a therapist years ago, and for for fertility, and we would try to we'd have everyone come up with an affirmation. Some many people had a hard time trying to come up with an affirmation because they're just like, I just don't believe that. Like mm-hmm. I am fertile. Someone's like, I I don't feel fertile. I feel like totally destroyed here. And so to have something that, that resonates, like, like you're saying, yeah, well, I'm like totally happy when, yeah. when right now you feel like on the ground in a puddle. But my, so my rebuttal, when people tell me positive affirmations don't work, I say, well, what are you already affirming? Because I am defective. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. Those are affirmations too. You know, you're affirming something already. So, and yeah, it may not be believable right now, but it's because we have these neuro pathways that are ingrained right now that say I'm defective, I'm unworthy, like that's our baseline. So we have to feed our brain new information that at first might feel like foreign or might feel like, oh, that's not true. But we have to do that in order to create those new neuro pathways. Trauma gives us this like these kind of like gray colored glasses, this negativity bias, you know, rightfully so, because it impacts our brains. Um, so in order to heal from that, we have to input new information. Yeah. And we're negatively hypnotizing ourselves with the whole loop of going all day long. That that's the thing on that we're hypnotizing with ourselves to, to start to, yeah, to interrupt that. Okay. So then we do, um, where are we? Desensitization? Desensitization? Do we desensitization? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 So that's actually, that's the bilateral stimulation. So That can be um, eye movements, um, that can be tapping. Um, If you're in person, there's these little like tapper buzzer things that you can hold on to that buzz, buzz, buzz. Um, So those are traditionally the ways that we do. There's some different audio ones too, but it's accessing both parts of the brain. So that's one part of it. And then the second part is it's keeping you one foot in the present, one foot in the past, because we want to access the past. We don't want to fully be in the present because then we're not accessing the past, but we also don't want to be fully in the past because then we're going to be re-traumatized. Um, so it's kind of like keeping our focus on the here and now while we're accessing the past memories. And so if we were to do a virtual session with you, then how would we, so I know you have some, like a little dot that we can follow or finger yeah. movement. Like, so can you just take us through, like, what, what is that? Like this, yeah. I guess this, this is the app, the the, what do we call it? The, the eye movement piece of it. Um, yeah. So there's just an app that therapists can use. That's literally just a dot. You can pick the color that you want, you know, and, and it just moves across the screen and you follow it with your eyes. Um, and then, you know, or you can do the tapping, whatever feels good, the butterfly tap. Um, so I let my clients choose what feels good for them. And so when that's happening, are sorry, are we, are we doing like, we're just, we're just looking at it. Are we, are we thinking or saying something or. 
So what happens is I'll tell you to access the memory, to bring up, you know, the disturbing information and the negative cognition that goes with it, those body sensations. And I'll say, okay, go with that. And then you're going to follow the dot on the screen, or you're going to tap for like 25 to 30 seconds. And then I'm going to stop the dot or stop the tapping. And I'm going to say, okay, what did you notice? What came up? And you're going to say, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. I was thinking about this or whatever. And then I'll say, okay, go with that. And then we'll start the dot again or the tapping again. And then I'll say, okay, what did you get? And we'll keep going through that process till the point where the person is like essentially desensitized. And they're like, all right, now I'm actually at like a seven now instead of a nine, or I'm at a five now. Um, we want to get you eventually to zero or one. Um, and that's the process. Yeah. So you could be like, I, when I see a pregnant belly, I'm very, very triggered. And that's like a 10 for me. It goes into like, oh my goodness, it'll, that'll never be me and I'm doomed. Totally. Um, and so kind of have that thought and then work, work your way down. And yeah, we, we do a similar thing with EFT. So emotional freedom technique with, with the tapping, um, being able to, 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 re, to reprogram. So we offer sort of some of these things as part of our re referral network, because they have to figure out what resonates with you. Sometimes people EFT, they're like, people love it. Other people are like, that gave me nothing. Yeah, and maybe yeah. maybe similar with uh, with uh, EMDR. Either it's like you're 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 into it, or it's just it's, it doesn't resonate. So you've got to. To, my thing is to actually explore it to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll use like, if somebody's bringing to the table attachment trauma, so that's any type of trauma that involves like a relationship, whether it's with parents or a partner, um, I'll take an attachment focus EMDR approach, which is actually pretty different. It's a lot more like um, visualization, tapping, different things like that than traditional EMDR, which is going to be more on like single event traumas or like, um, just different types of trauma that's not attachment focused. So attachment of like all like all your friends around you are pregnant, like what is that kind of thing? Or is it more like um, you know, more it's with... more gonna be kind of like what you were talking about in the beginning, like, you know, my father wasn't around as a child or he was impatient and stuff, or like my mom was an alcoholic, you know, and that really impacted my life and stuff. Um, things like that where there was trauma related to, you know, a parent figure, a caretaker, or something like that, usually. Um, okay. And the next one we have is installation. So what's that? So that's where once we get to that zero or one um, on the disturbance scale, we're going to install the positive affirmation. We don't call it positive affirmation, but um, what you would rather believe. Um, so that's where we're going to tap that in or do the bilateral stimulation to install that in. Um, then after that, we're going to do the body scan, which is checking the body for any residual effects. So if somebody's at, you know, a zero or a one, but we get to the body scan and they're like, you know, I'm still having like this stomach stuff or like, I'm still feeling it in my chest. I'm going to say, okay, well, let's go back into the memory and let's see what's still left in it. What's the worst part still left coming up for you? And then we'll kind of like keep digging through it, you know, cause we don't want, we want the body to be clear. We want it to feel relaxed and calm and the nervous system to be reset essentially. So creating a new, th a new thought off, off of that is essentially, is it a th so it's not an affirmation, it's just a new thought around the, the, the event. Is that yeah, at the end, if you're at a zero or one and you're able to install the positive affirmation and you you believe it. So we rate the level of believability also. Um, I don't know if I said that, but in the beginning, say, say the new thought is like, you know, I am capable of healing or getting pregnant or whatever. Um, say you only believe that at like a two right now, you know, and then at the end, you're like, yeah, I'm at a six or a seven, you know? Um, so that's what we want at the end to that, that will be more believable at the end. And then the body scan will be clear. Yeah, I, I do like our approach is mind, body, spirit. I really believe wholeheartedly. That's why I, I have these different, different uh, modalities as part of, part of our fat fertile method, because if you don't believe it, like if you don't believe this is really going to work, Wow. then you're going to somehow self-sabotage. There's, you know, there's all these different things that uh, not to say it's a, it's a self-fulfilling pro prophecy, but there's a very strong component of what you you believe. And then it kind of comes into how you act and what you attract and all of that. Is there anything you want to share on that piece? Yeah, I mean, there's some really interesting people out there like Dr. Joe Dispenza. Um, so there's some other ones that talk about how like our thoughts literally impact our DNA and our biology and cells and everything. And 
it just makes sense. Like if you're telling yourself, you know, and it's not like to blame the person, it's usually again, impacts of trauma, society, all these different factors. If you're telling yourself I'm defective, I'm not worthy, you know, your body's going to be more closed up, more sunken in, you know, maybe your voice is going to be lower, like these actual like effects of it, rather than like, if you're like, I am, you know, confident I can do this. Your body's going to be more open, more, your voice is going to be more confident, you know? So yeah, there's huge impacts. So we did the installation, then we did the body scan and then, so closure, what's that one? That's the seventh one, closure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just, you know, determining that, okay, we're either at a zero, our body scans clear We're you know, the positive belief is strong. Now, um, where do we want to go next? Do we want to go to a different target, you know, a different trauma, a different belief that's coming up, you know, what's, what's still left over or are we done with EMDR? You know, do we want to move on to something else? And then the reevaluation. That's where you would come back like the next session and we would ask like, okay, did anything come up over the week, you know, around this? Or are you still feeling pretty, you know, pretty solid, pretty good about it? Um, That's just where we decide like, okay, are we going to restart this? Do we still need to come back to this one memory? Can we move on? Yeah. And so typically are these sessions done weekly or what's the best kind of flow? Weekly for sure. And, you know, I I like to tell people that this is, this doesn't have to be a long-term thing, you know, like I want you to come in, do the work um, and then be done, you know, like not be in therapy your whole life. I think that would be great, you know? So um, yeah, so it should be weekly. I mean, if you can't do weekly every other, but we usually like to do weekly. And then if we were looking for, um, someone in person, obviously uh, Tess offers virtual sessions and we can talk about how to, to get one of those. Um, but as, as far as like the type of the, the training um, to look for someone else to look for, um, because, you know, as, as things get kind of buzzy, then there's lots of different types of training that may not, you know, be the best. So what, so what are we looking for? Totally. Yeah. I mean, you have to be a therapist. So whether that's a um, social worker, a professional counselor, a marriage and family therapist, you know, um, you have to be a therapist with a master's degree. You have to be EMDR trained. Um, So they'll put that in their bio, like EMDR trained. Um, You can go to EMDRIA. It's EMDR IA. I think it's like International Association, maybe. And they'll they have like a tab that says find a EMDR trained therapist. Yeah, I saw that yesterday. Um, when I was preparing. So, um, yeah, if you could share, so you did share, um, a couple books in here, but is there anything else you wanted to share that you're currently obsessed with, be it a a book, an app, a documentary, anything you're like, Ooh, just want to share that. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I brought my stack of books that I recommend <laughs> that everyone should read. Um, the body keeps the score is huge. Everyone should read that. It really helps us understand like the impacts of trauma along with waking the tiger. Um, that's by Peter Levine. He does somatic experiencing, but again, like he explains how trauma shows up in the body, getting past your past by Francine Shapiro. She's the creator of EMDR. That's a good one. Um, and then attached, that's a book all about attachment styles because attachment shows up so often in our relationship with ourself, with others, with our career, with, you know, partners, friendships. So yeah, those are the, my go-to books. Um, I have a, a lot of podcasts and stuff, but you know, I think I can't think of any off top of my head, but I'm a big book person. Awesome. Yeah. So my <laughs> <Yeah>. podcast, <laughs> um, is there a success story anything you'd like to share with us? So many. Um, I can't. Let's see. I mean, I've worked with people with complex trauma, whether that's childhood sexual abuse. I've worked with people with, you know, bullying in middle school, with people with um, body image stuff, you know, all sorts of stuff. I think it's just really cool to see the change, you know, so like they'll come in. Um, their level of disturbance will be high. These negative cognitions will be strong. The believability and the positive ones will be really low. We'll do the work and everything. Um, therapists are trained to add in some like cognitive interweaves, we call it. So it's, if you're feeling stuck or if you're looping, we'll do some things that'll help. Um, and a cool one that I'll do, um, sometimes is I'm like, okay, I want you to look at your hands, like notice your hands that you're an adult in this moment today is whatever you're, however old, Um, 
And then I want you to recognize that on one hand, you feel this way. And then on the other hand, you feel this way, because a lot of times we have conflicting thoughts, you know, like say if it was a person that we really loved and cared about who hurt us, you know, on one hand, I love them and I care about them. But on the other hand, I'm really hurt. And it's okay to hold space for both of those feelings. I'll do that. And like, it'll just flow right to the end. And they'll be like, yep, I'm good now. (laughs) Not exactly like that, but it's like, It's some things like that, that pull in the body, you know, um, connection and it's, it's really powerful. Great. Is there anything else you would like to share with us on this topic? No, I mean, I think that everyone, you know, we all struggle with these limiting beliefs, these negative self-talk patterns and stuff. Um, Definitely on the fertility journey. That's a big thing I know. Um, So I think it can really help be helpful for anyone. Again, you don't have to have like any massive trauma story, you know, um, you can just struggle with these day-to-day thoughts and stuff, or you can have the, you know, trauma, trauma subjective again. So, yeah. Yeah. And if you want to schedule a session with Tess, you can reach out to me, just uh, go to, um, fabfertile.com uh, and so fabfertile.com and then just go into the contact us and we can, um, we can uh, get a session scheduled for you. Obviously, um, we're having her as part of a referral partner for our um, couples coaching program too. So that is something for you to consider as well um, to, to, to address this trauma. Cause it's like, the more you, like, if you ignore it or like me, who was like clueless that it was even there, of course it was there. Like I, you know, even though I was like, I'm fine. And then all these things started coming up and I'm like, eventually you're forced to address it <laughs> or you're, you know, you're certain things in your life. You're like, why do I keep doing these patterns over and over again? Yeah. You're like, there I go again. Anyways, yeah. um, well, thanks so much, Tess. It was really a great session. Thank you. Yeah.